Hello and welcome to the next episode of The Podcast, the cannabis podcast for budding enthusiasts. As always, you're joined by your host, Heavy Days, here from the Upside Down Library, and we are incredibly grateful for our generous sponsors who help make this show happen. CT Now, the best and most trusted seed bank in the game, all the newest and hottest drops, they've got Lucky Dog Seed Co., Freeborn Selections, and new drops from Gas Reaper. They've even got some cheaper drops under the Best Coast label. They've got you covered all round. Guarantee on satisfaction, not just germination. If you're unhappy at the end of the grow, shoot them a message, they'll fix you up. That's how much they stand by the seeds they sell. They only stock the highest quality. And likewise, a huge shout out to Coppet Biological Systems. These guys are the industry leaders and have been offering a range of predators to keep your garden happy and healthy free of unwanted pathogens for years now. Notably, they've got the Ultimite, a phenomenal product, not just for getting rid of mites, but also they've built in proof of predation technology where the predator actually turns from clear to red once it's ingested. So you can visually see it's doing its job, keeping your plants happy and healthy. Check out Copper Biological Systems or all the stores that sell their products for all your organic and plant-friendly solutions to keep pests and pathogens at bay. Furthermore, shout out to ProMix. ProMix is a titan in the industry. They've been commercially supplying growers with high quality mediums and microbial products for years. However, they now offer an amazing standalone version of Mycorrhiza called ProMix Connect. This is some of the best quality mycorrhizal spores you can get your hands on with guaranteed numbers of viral spores in each pack, which we all know will directly result in your plants performing better. Be it increased yields, increased biomass, more vigorous growth in veg phases and better flavonoid, terpene and resin production during flower, ProMix Connect is your number one mycorrhizal product for anyone who's looking to treat their plants with only the best. Furthermore, shout out to Charlie's Cannabis. You know them, you love them. Family owned, craft produced high quality flour out of Oklahoma. But guess what? They've got more than just high quality flour. They've also been creating their own live resins. Sugar batter BHO, hand rolled water hash infused missiles. All created using flour, not shape. All created in-house using their own products, no material is sourced externally, and all production is done with the highest attention to detail. If you're looking for the quality of Mercedes but the approachability of a mum and pop business, check out Charlie's Cannabis in Oklahoma. And last but not least, we could never forget the Patreon game. Guys, you are the lifeblood of the show. If you would like to help support the show, please go over to www.patreon.com forward slash the podcast and consider subscribing. You'll get early access to episodes, unheard content and interviews, giveaways, freebies, Discord access, the list goes on. If you love the show and want to see it continue to happen, please consider checking out patreon.com. So gang, for this episode, we're lucky to be joined by Ben of Emerald Mountain Legacy, here to talk all things Royal Kush, his brother Mandelbrot, future breeding plans, and the Cali scene. So without further ado, let's get into it. Alrighty gang, a big thank you and welcome to the man running the ship at Emerald Mountain Legacy. The brother of Mandelbrot and carrier of the flame, Ben, thanks so much for joining us today and thanks for your time. Thanks for having me. I'm stoked to be here. Likewise, likewise. How's your morning been? Really good. It's almost evening here, but uh, had a good productive day and uh, been looking forward to talking with you. So yeah, no complaints. That's awesome to hear. The, the first question I love to ask people, what have you been smoking on today? Uh, a little bit of... Uh, oil spill and uh, a little garlic mince as well that a friend gave me. Oh, nice garlic mince. That's that's an interesting one. Is there like a lot of garlic coming through on that one, or more of the wedding mince? Uh, definitely garlic forward. It's you know it's I think it's pretty similar to GMO. The Kush mince is kind of hidden in the back, for sure. Yeah. Okay. And I mean. What's your thoughts and preferences on things like the GMO and the ChemD? Are you generally a fan? Yeah, you know, I'm not generally a big fan of cookie hybrids, but that one in particular is just amazing. I really enjoy it. Uh, GMO, I think, is one of the more unique 
profiles that's come out over the last few years for sure yeah interesting okay and i mean just because a little bit of personal love you know we love to talk about chem dog on the show have you ever been a big fan of the chem dogs at all or not so much yeah you know for me i really enjoy chem dog hybrids i feel like you know almost all of my favorites you know like uh headband and sour diesel and uh, you know some of the ogs and stuff are all relatives of chem dog and i enjoy all of them but i really feel like it's a good breeder and maybe like it chem dog itself isn't my favorite smoke but like almost everything you breed it with is great yeah okay that's cool that's good to hear and i mean you mentioned the oil spill earlier that's one a lot of people are interested in i guess you know sort of out the gate how would you describe the flavor the smell and the effect for people who you know haven't been lucky enough to come across it yet uh it's a unique one it you know my favorite phenotypes or uh chemotypes are um uh, they have like a, a two cycle engine oil smell to them you know like it can be a little bit propane-y sometimes but it's um there's like burned rubber and kind of like road tar and all these kind of really noxious what you know like in describing it it doesn't sound appealing but it's really really special the the smell and the taste and it's one of the most potent heavy indicas or well it's not even a pure indica but it, it's incredibly mercine dominant i've seen it test at like six percent mercine before which is crazy so it's a it's a good one for the real heavy smokers you know that description actually sounds lovely to me i think a lot of people are really into the sort of you know the gas and the skunk and the burnt rubber that sounds really appealing but something that definitely caught my eye about the oil spill was how it utilized the triple x og and i had been lucky enough in the past to try some of that i was so blown away by it i thought this is like a sick og it's so good but you really don't see it getting a lot of love from other breeders any idea why that might be it's a confusing situation because there there are a few different cultivars that have been called triple x og uh the one that we got a long time ago was from la and we got it like it, a friend of ours is who named it triple x og because he got it from a small dispensary in the bay area that was right next to a strip club and that's how it got its name but there's another triple X OG out there that's purple and it's not that gassy. And you know, that I'm not sure exactly where it all got confused, but the triple X that we use is green and it's super pungent and it's a real OG. It's not like, uh, you know, watered down at all. So, um, sometimes people are like, Oh, you mean this? And it's not what a lot of people think of as triple X. So, you know, um, but it's one of the earlier OGs that we got our hands on maybe 20 years ago or 15 years ago at least. Yeah, wow. Okay. I mean, generally speaking, that sort of checks out with the one I tried. I remember it was like a bright electric green and it just full on like lime flavor, like pure lime sort of thing. Does that sound right to you? Yeah, lime and like that chem funk, you know, like. Yeah, in the background. Yeah. Yeah. Diesel -y sort of stuff. Okay, cool. And so the oil spill seeds that are available through Emerald Mountain Legacy today, are they quite similar to sort of the original ones or is there any sort of changes in any of the parents? Um, well, what we try to do for the most part is to keep the, the genes pretty open. So you can find a range in the, the seeds that we put out with the some are leaning more toward the Royal and some more to the triple X. And, you know, with our back cross projects, that's a lot of the time what we're trying to do is to keep a wide array of phenotypes that are all good though. You know, like it's not like a total crapshoot, but we have our selections and we use three males a lot of the time so that you can kind of find a range uh, in there, you know, but my favorites are definitely the, the greener, uh, more chem, funky, the gassy ones, and not the the ones that lean to the royal, you know. 
Oh, okay. I mean, something I had heard from a variety of different people who were really fond of the brand was that they always mentioned the Emerald Legacy Seeds or just Emerald Seeds in the context of outdoor and how well they would do outdoor. Is that sort of a focal part of the breeding is to sort of cater for that outdoor market or it all or it sort of just happened to be that way? Uh, no, that's been our goal all along, for sure. You know, we started out in coastal Mendocino where you couldn't grow anything gassy back in the day because of the climate, you know, like it just couldn't tolerate it. So we we started out just trying to breed for ourselves and to make something that was gassy and appealing to the market that you could grow in our wet climate. You know, like we were in Albion in Mendocino County where it's, you know, foggy and wet all through summer and then it rains a lot in the fall, you know. And um, so that's, we were initially just breeding for our own use. And that's how we started. But over the years, we've, you know, gotten a reputation for, breeding stuff that can perform well in difficult climates and that's definitely what people come to us yeah really really solid point there for sure i guess just to loop back to the triple x for a moment you've got me curious now what's your all-time favorite og Ooh, that's a hard one i think the triple x you know because it to me it was one of the first you know it's a more authentic OG, if you ask me. Um, like the SFV and the Triple X were the only OGs I knew of 20 years ago, you know. And uh, there are a lot of other good ones and variations, you know. But for me, like when I think of OG, that's what I think of. I don't, I don't consider a lot of the newer versions to be the authentic, real deal, you know. Sure. I mean, there's a lot of discussion around OG in the community and. A lot of people sort of tend to agree with each other that they think the TK might have been the first or one of the first along with, say, the Ghost. My question to you is, these other OGs that have come out slightly afterwards, maybe the SFV, maybe the Triple X, do you think that they were crosses with males or more probably just S1s from the original? I think it was bag seed. I think they were accidental creations and... The TK was definitely around sooner, but it wasn't in Southern California, I don't think. I think for SoCal and like that market, I think that the Triple X was more prevalent earlier than the TK was. But like in Florida, you know, the TK was around earlier, I would say. But just from my recollection, and you know, this is 20 plus years ago, but the way I remember it is the SFV and the... um, triple x were more dominant earlier in california wow there you go that's that's cool to hear okay so take me back what was your first experience smoking cannabis oh that's a fun one um i was 14 and it was my birthday and my older sister took me to her friend bishop's house and they had this um you know, big elaborate bong with multi chambers, you know, like honey bears and acrylic tubes and all these tubes going in between them all. And I never smoked before. It took a huge bong hit, like way bigger than I should have. And for half an hour, I was like, oh, I'm not even high. And then I was fucking asleep for the rest of the day, you know, uh, trying to act all cool because I was with my older siblings and shit, you know. (laughs) Remember that super clearly. There you go. And I guess the question is, did you sort of have like an epiphany moment at that point thinking like, wow, this is something I could really sort of become a part of or did that sort of become more evident later on? No, I, you know, I hit the ground running for sure. I uh, started at 14, which is pretty young, you know, and um, I was a big fan of the, the culture of it, like not just smoking, but uh, you know, I was raised by liberal activist political types and just the fact that it was illegal and it was, you know, kind of this counterculture thing. I was really drawn to that. Yeah, gosh. I mean, I can only imagine what that would have been like growing up. It would have been awesome. Like, do you sort of have any, you know, memories that jump to mind about what it was like growing up in what largely could be described as like 
the epicenter of worldwide cannabis. It must have been an interesting experience. Yeah, you know, and we had a kind of unique perspective on it because we were born in San Francisco and we lived there until I was six and uh, brought or Mac were, was 12. And we moved to Montana because my mom needed to be near her parents who were, you know, elderly and sick and needed family nearby. So we lived in like the liberal bastion of San Francisco. And then we moved to a conservative area in Montana and we were hippies and like, you know, we didn't fit in quite right. And it was a shock, you know, to our systems. And um, so as soon like when, Mac was 15 he moved or he went on tour and then came back to California and then you know a few years later when I turned 15 I did the same thing I just as soon as I could get out of the house I came back to California and I've been here pretty much ever since okay wow and I mean when you first moved back what were sort of the real hot spots in the area for cannabis production is it were they still largely speaking the same ones as today or was the landscape a little different back then yeah, I would say it's more or less the same, but we, so when I was 15, I came out and Mac had um, established a little project in Albion in Mendocino County. And, you know, it was kind of the heyday of cannabis where the prices were incredibly high and, it, you know, you could grow really small scale and do very well for yourself. And, um, so it was, you know, it was kind of the glory days where you, you could grow like 50 pounds and do very well for yourself, you know, and the climate here was very good for quality. You know, you don't get big yields and all that, but you can grow incredible quality stuff near the coast for sure. And uh, so, you know, it was both a great place to grow, but also politically and just the community here was amazing so we were drawn to that for sure wow okay and i mean what sort of strains were they growing back at that time because you mentioned that you know some of the more gassy stuff didn't do too well and i'm sure that extends to even more genetics than just the gassy so i guess i'm sort of wondering what did do well there at that time uh we started with you know like salmon creek big bud and um there were like Highland Afghani, like before people started calling it OG or, you know, this or that, there were like some Afghani land race stuff, you know, like from the high mountains in Afghanistan. And that's what we started with for the most part, that and the Big Bud and, you know, a few other things. Um, when we got access to them, we started growing a lot of sour diesel and OG and, uh, headband and stuff but that we didn't have right off the bat so we were kind of working with what the local folks around here had okay sure and i mean i know you're friends with the guy mean gene we had him on not too long ago and there's a there's a few strains he remembers growing up with that he sort of wish he still had access to are there any that sort of fit that criteria for you yeah totally i was just talking to a friend today um you know like the trinity from Eugene area, uh, that one, one of the best I've ever seen, but I haven't seen it in a long time. And I just saw on Instagram today, a friend posted a picture and he's like, I got the Trinity and I, you know, I was kind of shocked. So I'm excited to see if I can get that one back. Uh, what else? Um, I don't know. Uh, yeah, I'd say sour diesel and trinity and you know like hindu kush there was a purple hindu kush that i used to grow that was just fucking phenomenal and i, I can't get that one anymore either you know a lot of the best stuff is kind of hidden away you know hard to find yeah it certainly seems like that i mean hopefully some of those old hindus pop their heads back out i think you know mean gene also mentioned that there was a, a few cuts, Hindu variety slash those early Afghans that he was particularly fond of. But if we sort of fast forward a little bit from your first grow, uh, your first smoking experience, how did you then get involved with sort of the growing climate? Did it come shortly after or was there a bit of a time delay? It was a couple of years later, but, you know, I was super fortunate to have an older brother who was six years older and who had all the same interests as I did, you know, so like, 
I was not very many 15 year old kids got to just go work on a pot farm, you know, drop out of high school and do that uh, at that age, you know. So I, I was just super fortunate to be related to my older brother and, to, you know, kind of have that that entry at that time, you know. Um, so for me, it was just like it wasn't even a choice. It was just like, here's what you're obviously supposed to do, you know, Um I don't know. Hard to describe, I guess. <laughs> no, it sounds like you were you were born into it, which sounds like a, a path I'm sure many of us wish we had sort of the opportunity to to walk down the way you did. I guess I'm sort of interested in those early years, you know, when you're first like for example, I remember when I first came to the States, you know, being from Australia, it's obviously all lots of just tents in people's um, you know, cupboards here. But when I went to the States you know, you see these big facilities and you're just, you're blown away and just everything's super interesting. Was that what it was like for you when you first got to the farm with Mac? Yeah, absolutely. You know, like, because he had been here a few years before I got here, uh, he had a whole network of people that were doing the same thing that we were doing, you know, or that he was doing. And uh, so I got to you know, learn from, you know, he was really one of the best growers that I've ever known. And so I got to learn from him, but I also got to see all these other projects that he was maybe involved in on the side or like, you know, provided plants to people or, you know, and also his elders, like people who taught him. And so it was really like a crash course, you know, I got to learn a lot really quickly. Yeah. Wow. What a, what an introductory sounds great. So, I mean, if you're able to recall any of the details, do you remember, you know, like I'm assuming you guys were outdoor, like we, you were growing organic, I assume. Like, can you give us a rundown on maybe if you remember any of the genetics you guys grew or like sort of the general style in which you grew? Was it like super soil or like amendments or anything like that you can recall? So, yeah, it was definitely organic, super soil, you know, not like the sub cool version, but my brother's own concoction that he had come up with um that he learned i think from uh i'm trying to remember the guy's name um friend of his in sonoma county who was you know maybe 10 years older um who had worked on a vegetable farm and so it was basically just a, a mix that they used to grow vegetables but you know if you can grow vegetables you can grow cannabis and uh so we started out in the pygmy forest in Albion, which is a really interesting climate because you're growing like to avoid being caught, you know, like they had the campaign against marijuana production back then camp and they flew helicopters all over and they were really gung ho about eradicating gardens. So we were growing in the pygmy forest where we had some light tree cover. So, you know, there was still good sun, but you couldn't see the ground uh, or plants really because of the, you know, like, a pygmy forest is like a forest where all the trees are stunted and they're smaller, you know, and they're not as densely foliated. So uh, it was the perfect place to, you know, hide your weed, basically. And uh, so we were growing really small plants and doing a lot of them because, you know, you couldn't go too big or they'd start to be visible from above. So we, you know, we had like trenches and small pots and we just do really a lot of plants. And that way, we were able to find special genetics because of the numbers, you know. So we were planting at one point like hundreds and thousands, even like I think 3,000 plants one time to find this special Highland Afghani that we were uh, really impressed by. We um, One year, we were doing like a seed propagation nursery where we would plant seeds and grow them up to be you know 18 inches tall and then sell them to the other farmers in the area and we were doing that all through the season until fall and um that the highland afghani that we used in the royal was just immune to the bad weather like all the other plants were dying and rotting and you know just couldn't handle the weather but this one plant just didn't look bothered by it at all and uh that's you know probably one of the keys to our success in breeding really strong outdoor cultivars is that we were able to hunt through those big numbers of plants and find the really special ones 
Wow. Yeah. I mean, you, you touched on some of the questions I had for you later. So thank you for doing that. I mean, I guess my first sort of inclination when you say that is, do you know where those Highland Afghani seeds come from? They sound like special stock. Uh, yeah. So it was from Obi from Sonoma County. That was the guy who couldn't think of his name a minute ago. Uh, so, you know, he was kind of a deadhead that my brother had met on tour um, before he settled in Mendo. And so Obi was kind of the, the key to our success because he had all the old school genetics that he got from his hippie friend on tour. And uh, he passed on a lot of that to us. Wow. It's, it's so remarkable how much of like the really influential genetics trace back to like a dead tour in some way. Yeah, that's the truth, man. It, like, or, you know, just the concert tour people in general, like the Trinity that I mentioned before, that was a fish tour thing that we got at a fish concert, you know, and uh, we, you know, like shake down street at those shows where everyone's hustling their different products, you know, like cannabis, and mushrooms and all this stuff. And, we had bought some flour from a guy there and we were just so impressed by it that we like hunted him down later and, you know, begged him to give us this clone, the Trinity clone. And, uh, you know, it's just a lot of like-minded people all coming together and doing business and, you know, partying together. And it's the perfect network for that sort of exchange. Yeah. Wow. I mean, it makes me wonder, do you feel like people were sort of more receptive back in the day to, for example, sharing clones with people? Because I guess it sort of feels like at times there can, you know, somewhat understandably be a bit of hesitation in giving clones out. Do you feel like that's changed a bit since back then? I definitely do. It, you know, like, it depends on the group and the circumstances, definitely. But back then if you were like a really passionate follower of the grateful dead, you were kind of in a club with these other people and it was like a big family, you know? Uh, so there wasn't that hesitancy to share that you find more often today. You know, it's, it's become a lot more commercial and, uh, more of a profit motivated thing than it used to be, you know, like we were all making a good living, but that wasn't the reason that we started doing it necessarily, you know, like we were really passionate about the, the herb itself and the also the music and the the whole thing you know yeah okay so do you remember when it was you did your first indoor grow or was it just all outdoor for the longest time uh that so you know we lived in mendocino on the coast for a couple of years and then we moved inland to uh, Greenfield Ranch outside of Ukiah, which was just an ideal growing environment. And we did that for a few years. And then we moved up to Arcata uh, in Humboldt County. And so that's when we started doing indoor. I think it was about 2002, 2004 uh, in there. And we lucked into a big warehouse in downtown Arcata, which is an interesting story in itself. But, uh, you know, um, we had gotten busted or not. We didn't get in trouble, but our weed got cut down on Greenfield Ranch. And it kind of motivated us to try to do indoor to avoid having that happen again. Um, so we had this warehouse in Arcata. It was, you know, a few blocks away from the plaza, a few blocks away from the police station. And uh, we did pretty big indoor in there. Uh and that was, you know, pretty bold. My brother wasn't as afraid of the consequences as a lot of people were back then. And so that continued for 10 years in Arcata at the warehouse there. Yeah, wow. I guess you had to really risk it for the biscuit. Uh, perfect you mentioned that because one of our listeners had submitted a question where they had been, you know, following both yours and Max's work for some time and they just gave a brilliant question, very succinct. They said, any crazy warehouse days stories from Arcata? Yeah. All right. So, yeah. Um, there was, so we rented this place from a tiling company 
they, you know, it was like where they stored all the tile for their business and they, they did tiling for, you know, homes and businesses all around town. Um, and they upgraded their space. And so we rented their warehouse from them and we built four 10 light rooms in the building. And then we kept the whole front of the building looking like a tile business. Like you could come into the building and it looked like just shelves and shelves of tile and everything. And then, you know, you go through a couple of more doors and then you get to the grow. Um, and my brother was friends with the guy who owned a local coffee shop. And so to mitigate the smell, we would pile coffee grounds outside where, right near where the ventilation came out of the building. And, you know, we, we use carbon filters and everything too, but it's still, even with the filters with, you know, really good quality air, but it's hard to keep that smell under control. So the coffee helped. Wow. That was like the, uh, sort of like back in the days when there's no carbon filters, right? Like you're just coming up with any way to <laughs> keep it all going. Did you ever have any like close calls where you were like, you know, the heart's racing and you're like, oh God, this is it. We're done. You know, not really at the building itself. There were times when there was kind of a general odor of cannabis in the neighborhood, but you couldn't pinpoint where it was coming from. So, like, you'd be a block away and you could smell the weed we were growing, but you couldn't tell where it was coming from. And, you know, it, it was kind of a funny thing that uh, the amount of cannabis that was there and it was so close to the police station and the busiest part of town and... You know, you, you, oh, also just a couple of blocks from Safeway in Arcata. Uh, but no, we never really had any heat. We just sometimes would be stinking up the neighborhood and people would be asking questions, but they wouldn't know who to blame. <laughs> That's brilliant. That's brilliant. I can imagine some young teenagers just walking around the block, just frustrated. They can't pinpoint it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Funny. Okay. So, I mean... When you started growing indoor, I'm assuming the, the quality of the cannabis went up a bit compared to the outdoor. Did that cause you to have any preference between the two? Like, I know me personally, like, I, I really like certain strains outdoors, but I think if I had to give a blanket rule, I sort of prefer indoor these days. Did that cause anything like that in you at all, having experience with the both? Uh you know, I wouldn't go so far as to say that indoor is better. It looks better. You can definitely make more attractive looking and probably a little bit more potent flower indoors. But if you're growing organically in a good climate that's not too hot, you know, like you can produce better terpenes or, you know, a more terpene rich product outdoors where it gets colder at night and you have that like saline humidity you know that, that you can't really beat mother nature in that way as far as terpene production goes i don't think um but definitely for potency and the looks indoor was better and you know as far as what people wanted to buy you know a lot of it was just based on the look and so yeah more marketable product but not better in my mind yeah, okay. And I mean, given when we discuss the the seeds that you and your brother have made over the years, there's always this notable element of how enjoyable it was for an outdoor strain. Are there any of the lines you're associated with that you think just sort of in your mind, at least definitively, you prefer them to be outdoor grown than indoor? Um, yeah. So with the Royal, the Royal Kush, um, it doesn't get as gassy and musky indoors as it does outdoors you know like it's still good but there's a unique profile to it when you grow it in a outdoor climate that gets kind of cold at night it has a totally different appeal than if you grow it indoors you know and um it's still great indoors but it's not the same like terpene profile at all uh, you know like especially certain like the gassier phenotypes are way better grown outdoors with cold nights than they are indoors that's that's brilliant because i'll i'll be honest i've only actually been able to smell and smoke um the royal one time but it was a legitimate source it was um i got it through a friend of the dragonfly 
Earth Medicine crew when I was at one of their parties. And I remembered it was outdoor and I remembered smoking it and thinking, this is one of the most unique terpene profiles I've ever smelled in the sense that you could smell the Afghan, you could smell the sour, but you could definitely smell the Urkel. And I think that was what, like, there was just something so intoxicating about that. Do you remember the first time you smelt it and were you sort of similarly blown away the way I just sort of described it or how did that go? Yeah, definitely. So before it was ever called Royal Kush, it, it was a uh, purple Kush diesel Afghani. And so it was in the Arcada warehouse and we, um, we had about 15 phenotypes that, you know, we made the first generation, uh, crossing the purple kush with the diesel afghani and um there were about 15 phenotypes and we labeled them all pkda one two three four five six you know um all the way through and so there it wasn't like i just experienced the royal as we know it now it was like this whole array of or a spectrum of the different parents you know and so we kind of just grew them you know two or three cycles in different you know different rooms and with slightly different feeding regimen and so we didn't really discover the most amazing ones until we had been growing a bunch of different versions of it for a year or so and um so then the pkda8 was the one that ended up being called royal kush later and it was it, you know, it was purple, but it was mostly sour diesel terpene profile with that Afghani too. But like the Urkel didn't really come through in the flavor, the smell. It was just the color that came from that in the one that we liked the best. Nice. And is this the cutting which sometimes I read about online is called Royal Kush 7 or is that different? Um, it's different. So the 7 is... A clone that Kevin Jodry selected, um, or well, I don't know exactly know how it all played out, but it's the one that he liked the best, and the one that I like the best is different. It's um, more diesel leaning than that one is, but for you know for outdoor uh, mold resistance and like the growability, I would say that's the best one, the seven. But the PKDA8, the diesel one, was my personal favorite for smoke. Yeah, okay. I mean, that makes sense. You know, different folks, different strokes. So I guess something I'm interested in is that you've got all these, you know, incredible strains that, you know, in the area are regarded as super well-known in just pretty much all of California. I think a lot of Mac's work is just really well-recognized. Do you remember him ever talking to you about, like, the process of when it was actually happening? Like, you know, he sort of comes home one day and he's like, oh, man, I just found this sick pheno in these seeds I popped that I made. Like, sort of as it was going along, do you remember him talking about it or it, or it more so just sort of appeared at the end of the whole creation process? Well, it, it was collaborative, you know. Like, we would – there were us and a few of our friends and people who worked at the – uh, warehouse in Arcata, you know, what Mac would do was he would just jar up and label like a dozen samples or whatever. And then he would let everyone try them and we kind of decide together what everyone liked the best. And, you know, it would change over time. There would be like, okay, we all ag agreed that this one's the best overall, you know, and then you grow it a couple more times and you'd be like, nope, never mind. We're going, you know, this one's better. And, so it was really convoluted. I can't even remember exactly how that all went because, there, you know, we were doing a lot of breeding projects all at once, not just the Royal, but we were also working on, like, the Maui Superdog and, the, you know, um, we bred a lot with some Super Skunk and Maui and uh, Chem Dog and Headband and, you know, so... It, the Royal was just one of those projects that we were working on all at the same time. And so we had hundreds of jars of really good flour that we were always, you know, trying to improve on and work in different directions. 
it sounds like you had so many incredible crosses on the sort of horizon for you guys that it was hard to see that just one of them was standing out to the other that's that's exciting and you mentioned the super skunk which is a strain which comes up regularly on the show what's your recollections of the super skunk and do you have any seeds with it as like one of the parents that maybe you're sort of keen to get into at some point well it's a little fuzzy because so long ago but it, the super skunk that we got was a clone, and we were told it was from Amherst, Massachusetts. Uh, so it, we called it the Amherst super skunk. And there was also oh, the Amherst sour diesel that we got from the same guy. Um, and I think that that was not so dog, um, or Francis is his name. Um, and we got a lot of good stuff from him, but... It was so long ago, like, I didn't even know Francis at that time. My brother had gotten these plants from him, I think. And that's the story as I remember it now. But, like, I never actually met Francis because he was real private back then. And But the Maui and the skunk and the uh, diesel all came from him. And maybe Chemdog, too. You know, it's a little confusing in my recollection. But he had all the good East Coast stuff and traded with my brother. Like, we had the L.A. Kush, which was one that was really incredible, too. And I think my brother traded that to Francis for a bunch of other stuff. Amazing. I mean, we actually had a few questions from the listeners about that sort of thing. And one of the really big ones that people were interested in hearing about was... Um, I'll, you know what, I'll just read you word for word what the question submitted was because that'll make it easier. So they've just said, I'd like to know if Ben knows anything about the seeds or cuts not so dog passed off to Mac. I think it was the super dog, question mark. I think it was a super skunk cross. Any recollections about that? Does it still exist? Um, so the way I remember it, we got the super skunk and the chem dog as clones and seeds of the Maui, um, but the I don't think that we got the the skunk by Kim or you know like the skunk dog or you know I think that we got them individually from Francis. That's the way I remember it. But it was so long ago, I'm not totally sure. Um, but so there was a Kim dog and the sour and the skunk and the Maui, and they were all individual. It's the way I remember. Nice. Okay, sure. Another one we had, which is sort of in that same line, is what's Ben's thoughts on the Maui dog slash super dog currently? He says, I'm running the Maui dog cross I-95. It's super nice. Uh, you know what? Because you, you didn't do the the super dog cross I-95. That would have been someone else, I'm assuming, right? Right, right. We did Maui super dog, which... You know, so it was the super skunk, the chem dog, and the Maui. And that's where our truth came out of. Um, you know, the truth was just one selection of that Maui super dog that we had made. Um, and I don't know that much about the... Uh, I know that there's a skunk dog out there that we didn't make, and there's a, a Maui dog out there. You know, like, a lot of the things that people breed have either been done before or are, you know, happening simultaneously in different people's hands in different parts of the world. And so there are definitely versions of all this stuff that we had nothing to do with or, you know, like, might be real similar but weren't ours or whatever. Um, but the Maui super dog is where our version came from. Yeah. Okay. That makes perfect sense. Yeah. The truth. Okay. Well, you know what, let's, let's loop back and jump into that. So it sort of makes sense chronologically. I mean, when I looked online, if you look at the forums, the sort of the, the big three strains that just, you know, continuously pop up when you're reading about Emerald Mountain seeds or Emerald Mountain legacies is, you know, the Royal Kush, the truth and the 707 headband um i guess my question is how did these come about did they come one after the other or were they all occurring as you sort of mentioned a bit earlier like at the same time or was there a progression 
it was all in the same window within a couple of years of each other because you know like when you start a big breeding project it takes a long time to hunt through it all and so we we started out by doing like three rooms of open pollination where we just had one male and a bunch of different females in there with that male or sometimes it would be three males of the same thing, you know, so you get a lot of variation or whatever. But um, so the the Maui Superdog and the PKDA that came, became the Royal were definitely at the same time. And then um, I think that the so there was a headband out there before ours and it was just headband. And the way I remember it is it came from a guy named Weasel. And I don't know much about him or anything like that. But our version, the 707 headband, was that crossed with the diesel Afghani that we had made. So, you know, there's a headband out there that isn't as well known, I guess. I think, I don't even know, honestly, all the details. But um, our version, the 707 headband, was the original headband crossed with the diesel Afghani. Okay, that makes sense. And I remember in a, a recent episode... We were sort of getting the rundown on the different headbands from Bob Hempill because he has quite a few. And he mentioned that, like, uh, Mac had been one of the people who brought one of them to the scene. I think it was... I think he might have said that the what you referenced earlier, the LA Pure Kush, might have even sort of got turned into a headband or renamed or something like that. Do you remember anything along those lines? Yeah, well... The, they're very similar. I can't remember exactly how it all happened. I know that we got the L.A. Kush from our friend Akasha in Los Angeles area. And um, we had that at the same time. And we had the other headband. And we had the Diesel Afghani. And the way I remember it, it was just the original headband crossed with the Diesel Afghani. But we did have that L.A. Kush at the same time, you know. And my memory is not perfect. I could have it a little mixed up. Um, but the L.A. Kush had a little different thing going on, you know, uh, had a little more leaning toward the chem than the 707 headband. But um, we did get like we had my brother was known for distributing those cuts early on the L.A. Kush, the headband, the SFVOG and the Sour Diesel. A lot of people think he bred all of that stuff because he was the first one that had it back then like you know 25 years ago or 23 years ago whatever so you know he didn't take credit for the stuff but because he was the source in north like northern california hadn't seen any of that stuff before he started pumping out the clones in arcada so there's a lot of confusion as to like where it all came from and you know people have credited him for breeding the sfv for example, but he didn't. He just got it before anyone else did, or, you know, that kind of thing. Yeah, no, that makes sense. Sure, okay. So, I mean, you may not remember, but do you remember sort of around this time, what, out of curiosity, what were some of Mac's favorite strains to smoke on? Uh, definitely Headband and the L.A. Kush. I, I think the L.A. Kush was probably his, the, what he smoked the most, for sure. Um, and the Sour. He was a huge, huge fan of the Sour. I guess those two would be his top smokers, the Sour Diesel, like the original Sour and the L.A. Kush. Yeah, two two powerhouse picks right there. As far as you're concerned, do you think the original Sour still exists? Yeah, definitely. The one that we had for a long time and still have, a lot of people call it the AJ Sour, but I don't know for sure if AJ had anything to do with it or what, you know, it was, it was a clone that we got from a friend in LA. Um, and, and so I don't know which version, you know, but I've seen it called AJ Sour previous or, you know, more recently. And back then it was just the only Sour that existed as far as I knew. So there wasn't like, oh, it's this one or that one or whatever. It was just Sour and that was it. Yeah, okay, cool. I mean, it's one of those ones which... I'm not sure if I've ever really had real sour. It's hard to know, you know, because people talk about it so so mythically. It's um, it's sort of hard to know. Are you trying the real thing or, like, what's the situation? And, and you know, with old clones, they they sort of start to can fade a little bit, you know? 
Yeah, but the, I mean, the real sour is so special that you would know if you found it, you know, uh, really unique and special. You know, it's it, kind of the foundation for our whole breeding program, I would say. So it's, you know, both for my brother and I, it's kind of the the, the origin of all of it and our, our favorite. Yeah, no, that makes sense. So last question sort of from a super historical basis I had for you was, do you remember what it was like when OG first hit the local scene you're in or were you already a part of the community? And I guess I'm sort of wondering, was it just like this monumental sort of paradigm shift when it first got up there or was it sort of slow to catch on and then it started dominating things more? Well, so it, it was very hard to find. And, you know, no one in the Emerald Triangle had it until my brother got the clones and started pumping them out. Like, the people who had it kept it to themselves. And, you know, it it was special and it was so coveted, the, the flower, that the people who had it didn't want to let it out. And we were lucky to have a friend who passed it to us and didn't give any rules on whether we could give it out or not. So my brother just started pumping it out, you know, um, the, all of that stuff, the headband, the SFV, the LA Kush and the sour. And so he kind of changed the whole game in the Emerald Triangle that way, you know, um, he was, he was making thousands and thousands of clones every month. And, there weren't a lot of people doing that because it was so risky to have so many plants back then, you know? Uh, so it, like it definitely started the whole transition to everyone growing gas out of that Arcata warehouse. Wow. You know what? You've, you've just made me realize I'd be a fool if I missed this opportunity to ask given, you know, how many clones you guys must have done over the years. How do you root clones? What's your method for doing it? Uh, my favorite for my own projects is easy cloner and then putting them directly into soil, like, in, you know, in a four inch pot. So you like get a nice healthy root mass and then transplant that big ball of roots into the soil in a four inch pot. That's, you know, it, there are a lot of good ways to do it, but I don't really like to have rock wool or oasis cubes or any of that stuff in my soil because I, I feel like it's you know there's always algae and all these different issues so i like to use an easy cloner and then just take the plant with the roots and put it directly into some good soil uh and avoid those mediums that way nice uh, a man after my own heart i guess the follow-up is how would you broadly describe your growth style? Is it sort of like a no-till sort of thing, or is it a little bit of like a mixture of other things? How do you do it in soil? I pretty much copy my brother's methods. You know, it's uh, just making a really rich, very humic, and very like a, a compost-heavy soil with a lot of amendments. And then, for the most part, just feeding or, you know, just watering and you, you use a little molasses and some kelp and stuff in your liquid feeding and, you know, maybe sometimes make a, a, a fertigated tea with some guanos or whatever. But if you just start with really good soil that's got all the stuff in there, you know, it gives it time to break down and to become available when the plants need it. You know, if you're growing organically and you're making liquid f food for your plants, it's it's not really doing anything for the plants when you water it in. It has to break down and, you know, the whole, the biology in the soil has to really have some time to work. And so you need to have it all in there at the beginning. That's my opinion. Okay, nice. And I mean, we've got a pretty healthy population of outdoor growers who are listeners for the show. Do you have any you know, maybe really good tips or tricks in your mind that might help them get more out of their outdoor plants or something which maybe you see people often doing wrong when they're outdoors? Oh, man, that's a big question. There's so many different ways, and, you know, I'm not going to tell people my way is better. I just know what works for me. And, you know, there's so many variables and just, like, how much you water and how much... Like, or maybe my soil recipe is going to be too hot for some people, or, you know, and it might burn plants or, you know, depending on 
environmental conditions and all of these different things. So it's very hard to give advice that is going to apply to everyone or to every grow, you know. Uh, so it really, I, I can't can't say much on that just because it's so specific to different ele- or, um, variables, you know. But for people who really don't know where to begin, I would say to read the article my brother wrote, uh, The Lowdown on Dirt. And you can find that on our website at emeraldmountainlegacy.com. Um, that is pretty, you know, it's old. He wrote that more than 10 years ago. Um, but it's a real good introduction to all of that, for sure. There you go, gang. Some required reading homework for everyone. I'm going to go have a read on that one myself after we wrap things up here. But that's good to know. Thank you for that. Sure. I mean, if we fast forward a little bit, I'm I'm sure a lot of people are aware, but, you know, really sadly in 2015, Mac passed away. And I guess I'm just sort of wondering how did that change things when he passed away? Was it obvious to you that you needed to continue Emerald Mountain or was it a more of a slow discovery as you sort of grieved and dealt with his loss? Yeah, man, it was a whirlwind, you know, I, it, it started out just my younger brother and I, you know, like Mac passed in October of 2015 and his crop was still standing and, you know, um, he has kids that needed to be provided for. So it started out just uh, my younger brother, Bogey, and I helping to harvest that crop and to try to, you know, turn it into cash for the kids. And that was a big undertaking. And, you know, it all happened, like my daughter was born that summer right before my brother passed. And so I, you know, I was balancing a lot of plates for sure, trying to, you know, raise an infant and um, provide for my own family and to help get, you know, a solid foundation for my brother's kids. And so I really didn't even have time to think about a plan at that time. It was just like dealing with circumstance after circumstance and trying to just get through it you know so I didn't it kind of all just happened one step after another and I didn't plan any of it really Uh, (laughs) it's funny to think about it that way but um, yeah so it started out just trying to like make sure his crop uh, went to where it should and um, you know we tried to save the farm so for the first year like so he was about a hundred grand behind on his mortgage. He had gotten robbed about a year before uh, he passed. And so he was really far behind on the mortgage. And um, we were just trying to save the farm and save the crop. And that was our focus initially. But then shortly after he passed, the new laws in California kicked in, you know, the uh, adult use cultivation and in Mendocino County they um, said that you know the only people eligible to apply for licenses are pre-existing cultivators and you know it's really unfortunate because my brother passed right before his like lifelong career became legal and you know like something that he could admit to doing publicly like it was very underground and um you know, like using code names and fucking uh, pseudonyms or whatever. Uh, and then just, you know, six months after he passed, it is all of a sudden legal. And I'm not sure, you know, he wasn't a fan of the regulated market and licensing and all of that. But, you know, I think he would have eventually been happy to be able to come out and speak more openly about what he did. And like, not use the pseudonym and, you know, like, you know, hard to explain, but, um, you know, he passed right before it all changed a lot. Yeah. Okay. And so when you finally started to sink your teeth into the idea of doing Emerald Mountain Legacy, was there anything that immediately jumped to mind as like, oh, you know, like we've got to crack these seeds and start doing this strain? What was sort of first on the agenda? So he had done this huge uh, shotgun crux is what he called it, where 
you know, he had a bunch of female plants and he had two groups of males, uh, the, the Maui super dog and like OG truth band males on one side and the Royal Kush males on the other, a big open pollination. So like his thinking was that, you know, there would be a little bit of like cross pollination where you don't know for sure what the male was, but that you'd have like the plants on the one side would be mostly pollinated by the Royal males and the plants on the other side would be mostly pollinated by the, the truth and the OG truth band males. And so we had this like ridiculous amount of seeds and they were all just labeled by number based on what the female was, you know? And so we had this catalog of like hundreds of different, uh, plants and, you know, we just, it was a ton of work trying to sift through and find the special stuff in there. And we haven't even finished that work to be honest. Um, so we had a, a big project on our hands. Definitely. Yeah. Wow. I mean, it, it raises the question when you're looking to work on a project, how many seeds or what sort of numbers do you like to run to sort of be confident? You've got a good idea of what's in the seeds, what's lurking there, what might not be there. How do you like to do the pheno hunt, so to speak? Um, you know, the, I mean, to find special plants, you need to grow a lot of them. And so I would always try to do one project at a time. Like my brother would always do these massive projects that you'd have so many different com combinations that it's almost impossible to grow them all out and to find everything that's in there, you know? Uh, I think the way he thought about it is he would make sure to use really strong parents and then to give those seeds out to people so that they could find special stuff. And um, that's, you know, I think that really works for certain people who like to hunt through a bunch of different stuff and find special ones and keep them around as clones or whatever. Um, but what I found is that what people wanted from me after he passed was to keep the things that had been found out there and that were really special. And just to make sure that we had versions of those things commercially available, you know? And so, um, really just trying to make sure we didn't lose anything was my focus. Yeah, understandable that you'd want to make sure none of those lines go dead, so to speak. And it sort of segues into the next few questions I had for you nicely in terms of when you're working with these lines and they're sort of established and you're looking to preserve them, how do you go about preserving them? Are you looking to utilize all the females and males that don't have hermaphroditic traits or are you still doing some minor amount of selection or is it just a free-for-all open pollination how do you do that one um it definitely depends on where you start in the process like you know with the royal kush my brother had already back crossed it seven times or eight times actually or well no the first generation then seven back crosses to get to the eighth generation so with the royal for example i his goal was to get that to the 10th generation of back crossing so i just continued with that until we got to the 10th generation but um and i'm doing that with the oil spill too but we're only on the seventh generation on that one um but the idea of back crossing for us was that you keep most of the genetic material from the original so that there's still some variability and it's it's kind of like the original cross where you have a bunch of different phenotypes some of them leaning towards one parent some of them leaning towards the other but more and more like once you get pretty far down that road then your focus in my mind should shift to trying to isolate the special individuals and make seeds of those individuals um that come out mostly the same so what i've been working on recently is trying to like isolate the sour leaning phenotype of royal kush and the afghan leaning one and the the grapey strawberry one you know and so after getting to that 10th 
generation backcross. Now I'm working on making F2s and F3s of, you know, like the sour and the the um, Afghan and the strawberry and grape versions. And so with those projects, the goal would be for the seeds to all be mostly the same and isolated into those different groups. Uh, but, you know, there are so many different goals for different purposes and stuff that you know it very much depends on what you're trying to do okay yeah brilliant answer there and i think you might have sort of answered this next question but i'll just um double back just to make sure we got the right thing one of our listeners was wondering they said you know is it true that there's like a, a royal kush fino that's sort of like a strawberry jam and and if so is it like a unicorn does the average person have any chance of finding it or it's really buried in there Okay, so there definitely is one, and it's very much different from all the other royal selections. Um, we put it out as the snozberries this uh, season, um, uh -huh. and you know we're sold out of it right now. But if you want that strawberry uh, selection of the royal Kush, which you know it's not very similar to royal otherwise, like it's not gassy. And it's not very strong smoke as flour, but it makes incredible concentrates. Like the, the strawberry terpenes come out very, very strong and concentrate. And it just tastes incredible. And the most like strawberry of anything I've ever seen out there. Um, but, it, you know, it, it's not that impressive as flour. But when you concentrate it down, it's really, really special. Um, so, yeah. That's what that one's all about. Nice. There you go, people. The snozberries. I had seen that one when I was looking at all the different strains on offer. So it's a good name. I like it. Um, so, I mean, just touching back on what you mentioned before about having done the BX8 and uh, even to the 10, I guess I'm wondering, are there any, you know, perceivable differences you've found between, say, the F1 and the BX10? Um, in the, I'm sure by the BX10 you've you've got the the phenotypes and the type of plant you want in seed, but have you seen a gain or loss of any traits since that F1 generation? Definitely. You know, you set out with a goal and sometimes you get there and sometimes you don't. And um, I found that the eighth generation back cross was the best. And, you know, our goal was to get to the 10th generation back cross. And we did that, but it didn't improve from the eighth to the 10th. And I, I think that inbreeding depression is probably the reason for that um but so basically the 10th generation has some really incredible plants and some of the gassiest phenos of royal that i've ever seen but it also has some that aren't as desirable too you know and it's so with the 10 you kind of have to hunt through and find the really special ones and keep them around whereas the eighth generation you could grow them out and they were all incredible you know, they were all very good. Not quite as good as some of the ones that you find in the 10, but better than a lot of the others, you know. And so as a breeder, like, I don't use, like, um, genetic testing and stuff to, like, you know, like genome mapping and all this high-tech stuff. We've just done it the way we are used to doing it for so long that I don't really use those tools. And so you might set out with a goal of, um, you know, let's say trying to get the, the gassiest Royal that you can and you'll, you'll try that and maybe you won't get there the way you meant to, you know, and you'll have to go back and start again at a certain point or whatever. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, no, that, that makes sense. And I think that, you know, undertaking a project, you know, that's at least 10 generations deep, it, it makes sense that you maybe need to go back at certain points and relook at things. It sort of plays into the next question being that there's a lot of people with a variety of sort of royal stock, you know, different generations, different sources, maybe just F2'd and given to them by a mate sort of thing. Or, I mean, maybe it's not an F2, maybe it's an F6 or F7 or whatever. I guess my question becomes... Have you found uh, a breeding style that you prefer more? Like, do you prefer to back cross those lines? Or do you think filial breeding, like F2, F3, sort of brings more to the table? Or does it have different purposes? 
Well, for the way the cannabis business has evolved, I think that filial breeding is going to please more people. But it depends on the people that you're catering to. Like, my brother definitely liked to hunt through a bunch of different plants and to find ones that were, like, his special one, you know. And there are a lot of people out there that are that way, where they they want variation and they want to find their unicorn. And the hunt is really thrilling for them, you know. But the more commercial this all becomes, the more people just want some seeds that all come out the same and are pretty good, you know. And um, so I'd say it's it's going further and further towards the direction of people just wanting seeds that come out consistently so that they can mix those plants together and market that product as one product. But there are still those people who want to have a bunch of different ones and they're okay with the fact that they can't mix the flowers together and sell them as one thing, you know? And, um, so we're definitely going to continue with both, but we're going to be focusing more on making F twos and F threes and isolating traits into seed lines that are consistent because that's more often than not these days, that's what people need to be successful. Yeah, definitely. I think, yeah, what you said reflects, uh, you know, a little bit of the changing landscape in the market. It causes me to wonder, you've made a lot of really nice looking crosses since starting to work with the Emerald Mountain Legacy brand, so to speak. Um, a few of them had really, really caught my eye, you know, like, I mean, obviously the the old faithfuls, but new releases like the you know the the 47 and the black lime pie and the royal limes all the things like that out of all the new lines you've been putting out what are the some of the ones that you're most impressed with and are maybe considering doing more with going forward uh those you mentioned definitely um but the royal wedding i think is my favorite well the royal limes and the royal wedding are my two favorites um you know i like wedding cake a lot but the royal wedding takes most of what's appealing about wedding cake and puts it in a eight and a half week finisher which you know wedding cake goes really long and that's difficult for a lot of outdoor growers so the royal wedding is something really special because it's that really high demand product but it finishes fast and it's easier to grow and so i'd say both i like it a lot and it's very popular because of that early finishing and really appealing product but like the royal limes um there's one unicorn pheno that might be my favorite weed ever it's like very skunky and very limey but it also has that like vanilla Skittles element to it. And it, the f- flavors don't really muddle. Like they don't mix together. Like you squeeze a flower once and it smells like skunk and then you squeeze it again and it smells like vanilla. And then again, and it's limey or, you know, it's like it's unique in that way where it has a lot of different elements to it, but they kind of come out at different times and, um, it's not like blended together, you know, it's unique in that way. Um, the black line pie is another amazing one. Uh, you know, like it could be really loud cherry or really limey or more royal dominant. Um, and really beautiful. As far as looks, that one's probably the best looking flower. I would say, but you know, it's different strokes for different folks. There's a lot of good stuff in there and it's depends what you're into. Yeah, definitely. I mean, it's, it's interesting. You mentioned the Royal wedding cause that was one I had sort of scribbled down and thought that looks really neat. And I guess as a follow up to what you sort of already touched on with that one, do you plan to maybe continue taking some of the popular, Um, you know your wedding cake type ones where they're that real sort of hype market um, and then trying to work those into sort of more grower friendly lines be it as you said like you know faster flowering or it sort of handles the conditions a bit more is that something we might see going forward or more of a one absolutely we're working on that right now it just takes time you know because 
if you're growing for people who are going to grow outdoor, you don't want to be breeding that stuff indoors because like the, the heritable traits, you know, like it's like acclimatized, like people from the Andes, right. Uh, developed barrel chests over time so that they could breathe better in that really high altitude that they, their ancestors come from. Right. It's like that, where if you're going to grow outdoors in a difficult climate, you need to breathe outdoors in a difficult climate or you're going to move away from those traits that were so helpful to you in that environment, you know? So we can only do one breeding cycle a year outdoors in the natural way that you would do that if you're trying to produce something that would perform well outdoors. So a lot of breeders can get through four or five filial generations in a year. We can't, you know, um, not when we're intending to provide for people who are grown outdoors. So we are working on those, each one of those lines right now, but it's, it's a slow process. Yeah, certainly. I can imagine. I mean, I looking on the website and another thing sort of related to the outdoor growing was I noticed that there was a few packs where you were selling them in much larger volumes, like, you know, like maybe a hundred plus seeds in a pack is that something you release because you're sort of trying to cater for outdoor growers or is it more so that people can run big pheno hunts and find that really special one? Uh, both. And, you know, that's something that we're going to do more going forward, offering, you know, bulk quantities at a discounted price. Um, I didn't know for sure how much demand there would be for that, but I just put out the spice cream and, 120 packs and that was really popular people are really into it you know because they're getting a good deal and they're getting a lot of seeds um so we're going to do that more and more yeah that's exciting okay cool 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 and uh one of the questions submitted by one of our listeners was they were wondering if you had noticed any specific traits on the royal line which might indicate that the male was going to be a good breeder. And I guess this is probably subjective in terms of what traits you want to pass on, but I guess they're just generally wondering, you know, anything to keep an eye out for. So in the Royal, um, we most often do our selections for males based on vigor, you know, just strong plants that get bigger than the others faster, but also on stem rub which is a tricky thing because to really have a good stem rub, I think a plant needs to be grown totally organically and it will have a stronger stem rub, you know, the smell if it's done outdoors. So if you're growing outdoors and you're doing it organically, look for the really funky kind of skunky, gassy, rubbery stem rub in your Royal Mail. Um, but you won't find them very often. Like the, a lot of the plants will all have the same smell when you rub the stem, but then one in 50 will be really incredible compared to the rest. And so if you have enough of them to hunt through and find the one that really stands out with a strong stem rub, that's a good bet. But going off of vigor is another good way to do it. Yeah, okay, that that all makes sense. And I mean, if we talk specifically about the Royal Kush line itself and the Backcross project, are there any particular traits that you're looking to really focus on and preserve slash take it forward in that direction? Or is it more of just keeping it open? Well, like I said, I'm, I'm isolating the different traits that we liked in the Royal. So for me, that's the early finishing sour profile. So it's uh, greener and sour diesel terp dominant, but early finishing because that's what really made popular or the Royal popular was it's early finishing mold resistant gas and it's purple. So that's definitely something we're going to continue to refine and isolate. And then there's also a really special Afghan dominant that's uh, more like an OG, but a lot greasier. Like it has the, you know how the resin can, if you put it in a bag, some herb will like rub grease all over the inside of the bag and some won't it'll be more dry uh 
crumbly resin, you know. Um, so we're trying to get the greasy OG selection as well. And then the strawberry and the grape selections. Um, so we're isolating those into their own groups uh, and trying to make, you know, individual. They'll still be Royal Kush, but we'll say, like, this is the strawberry selection and this is the sour diesel selection and uh yeah yeah okay and i mean just a moment ago when you were referencing the stem rubs you sort of mentioned like you know you might get a skunky sort of thing the whole family and um you know sort of hot topic in the community at the moment is skunk genetics you know particularly that more acrid sort of thing is that something you have any memories of or something you'd like to work with going forward or you're sort of more focused on other stuff? No, it, so I'm just as intrigued by all of that as most everyone else seems to be. Um, I really enjoy skunk terpenes. And, you know, as far as strong smoke, I think it's some of the strongest out there if you find the, you know, the real deal. But I think it's, there's this, something got lost in memory because skunk weed doesn't really smell like a skunk when you have it right up in your face, you know, like when you're squeezing it and sniffing it, um, it doesn't have that same smell, but like if you have it in a backpack in a hot car, it's like very skunky it, because it's this like odor that kind of, um, evaporates into the, the ambient air you know and so i think this whole hunt for the real deal skunk is kind of misguided because you know like sour diesel you have really good sour diesel and you put it in a backpack and it gets hot it smells like a skunk you know and i think um you but you take it out and you squeeze it and you roll a joint and you're smelling it up close it has more to it than that it's got that you know the fuel and everything but so i think People reminisce about the skunk that they used to have and that nobody has anymore. I don't really think that's an accurate way of looking at it. I think, you know, gassy weed is skunky and limey weed is skunky. And if you, you know, in a certain circumstance, it's going to smell like a skunk. But if you get up close, it's not going to have that same exact profile. And it has a few additional elements, you know, and so... People think like, oh, no, I want that real skunk from the 80s. And I think we still have it. I think like sour diesel and uh, the limey OGs and stuff are skunky weed. And I think that people in their memory, they're kind of misremembering what it really was. You know, like I don't think there was ever anything that was purely skunk terps. You know, um, there's always been like some skunkiness with some other elements and i think that nostalgia and you know the way our olfactory system is tied into our memory has complicated the way people remember that yeah most certainly most certainly on the topic of sort of fabled genetics do you have any like old school or special strains in your collection that you're sort of itching to bust out and do a phenohan or work on in the future yeah so the headband we're really really trying to make good headband seeds and it's kind of similar to like trying to make a sour diesel seed line it's hard to do because there are a lot of recessive traits and you can breed it and breed it and breed it all different ways and you might never get there you know like we're working on both trying to make sour diesel or seeds that come as close to sour as we can and the headband as well but we're just not quite getting there yet, you know? And so we're working on that and it's a slow process and it's a lot of like two steps forward, one step back or two steps back, one step forward, you know, and it's just got to work through it. But yeah, I'm excited to eventually get back the 707 headband in seed form that we really like. Nice. And I mean, is that you thinking that might be sort of like a recreation or you're looking to do it via a different genetic pathway? Well, we're trying to start with the parents that we started with before. And, you know, like we have the clones and um, some seeds that are close, you know, like the diesel, diesel Afghani seeds. And so we're kind of like 
redoing processes that we've done in the past, but it, you, a lot of times you can take the parents that you think are going to create this thing and just based on, you know, the random probabilities of all of it, you don't quite get what you wanted out of it, you know, and, or maybe you have some traits that aren't desirable, like a herm or, a, you know, some weird structure problem with the plants or something. So, you know, it's, it, it, so it takes time to do that. And also we're just doing a lot all at once. Like I run a farm that, you know, 15,000 square feet of uh, light depth and full term and also trying to do all these breeding projects and it's, we're spread a little bit thin. So takes a long time to get through all these projects. Yeah, I can only imagine. And, you know, I'm going to play devil's advocate here and try to throw a little bit more work on your plate. Do you ever plan to do any work with, like, some sort of more sativa-related lines? I noticed that's something which, you know, I might not have been able to spot it, but it wasn't particularly represented. Is that something you would ever do, or you're more sort of just into the indica stuff? Well... I personally get paranoid when I smoke sativa dominant stuff. It's just something with my body chemistry. It doesn't really agree with me. And that's, you know, for me to be good at breeding, I have to breed things that are appealing to me or I can't make a good selection and I can't create a product that I can really be proud of and, you know, put my name on it. Um, So I do kind of, focus on the things that I like and indicas work for me or you know I don't even think the indica sativa thing really makes sense it's like the, there are broadleaf plants that have a, a sativa type of chemical profile and vice versa you know so that whole way of talking about it doesn't even really make sense to me but I do focus on myrcene dominant terpene profiles definitely and beta caryophylline um, and I stay away from a lot of the more sativa dominant stuff. I, it's mostly my own taste and feeling like in order to be good at breeding, I have to focus on things that are appealing to me. But also I think the market much prefers gas and mercy dominant flower too. So yeah, I'm not sure that I will focus much on sativas just because they're not what I would choose to smoke, you know? Yeah, okay. I mean, that sounds like some good advice for, you know, people looking to breed, like read the things you're passionate about that you can discern and whatnot. Do you have any other sort of recommendations for people sort of aspiring breeders, maybe looking to start their own breeding program? What would you recommend to them in terms of how to do things properly? To do only one breeding project at a time. Don't start by putting a male in with 50 hype clones because you'll create too much work for yourself to hunt through all of those plants and to find the ones that are special that you should continue breeding with. Like, you know, the Royal is a good example where we started with, you know, three plants and, you know, we crossed two of them together and then we crossed those two with the other one. And just by refining that work over, you know, 15 years or whatever, we found really special stuff that's very different from the other phenotypes or whatever, the different profiles that are in there. You don't need to use a lot of starting material to find a lot of different things in the lines you're working on. You can, you know, just really thoroughly hunt through one cross and that would be more rewarding, I think, for people than it would be to try to, you know, put a male in with the 50 hype clones and then to try to hunt through all of that will take you a really long time and it'd be really difficult. So focus on one project at a time is my advice and to be thorough and to take your time doing it. Solid advice, solid advice. So something I wanted to bring up and ask you was how do you feel slash how do you deal with the sort of variety of various companies that have been using a lot of Mandelbrot's genetics in their work, probably more notably since his past, you know, are you okay with it? Do you have any issues? What's your thoughts on that? I'm totally okay with it. In fact, I, I like it. I think the more his work gets out there, the better. The only time I've had issues is when people are lying and misrepresenting relationships or, saying they're doing it for charity when they're not, and you know, like 
there's a good way to do it and a not so good way to do it. If, if you're just making knockoffs for profit and you're lying to people about your relationship with him, which is a thing that has happened several times, I really don't like that. And I've spoken out about it, but if you're just breeding things that you like and like maybe making a recreation of his work and you're doing it with respect for him and the, you know, the work that he put in, I'm totally all about that. You know, it's just the, the being decent about it is important. Yeah. Okay. I mean, sort of the, the elephant in the room, but I think people will sort of expect us to, to touch on it. Um, you know, there has been a few releases from aficionado seeds in the past, which were just sort of straight filial breedings or just sort of extensions without necessarily new input of genetics um, that were done under the aficionado brand. Has that ever did did Leo make good on the um the the promises in terms of donating funds towards um your your nephew and the the things that were sort of said at the time or is that still a contentious sort of no not at all so that's that was kind of the example I was bringing up and I don't like to talk about this stuff too much but people ask all the time so um yeah he, uh, you know at the Emerald Cup a few years ago he put out the oil spill and he said that all the proceeds were going to charity for my nephew who had had a stroke like you know my brother dies and then not very much later his son has a stroke and almost died like he was life flighted between hospitals and you know clinging for life and right around that same time this guy is selling knockoffs and saying the money is going to charity charging $800 a pack for the seeds and keeping all the money. You know, he gave a really tiny percentage of it publicly, like through GoFundMe. You know, he probably sold 300 grand worth of the seeds and he gave a few thousand dollars uh, in a public way to make it look like, look what we're doing for this sick kid, you know. But he was lying and cheating and um, promising us that oh when he has the money he's going to give us a bunch more and never intending to make good on it and you know it's not selling seeds that were you know my brother's creation that bothers me it's the fact that he was lying and stealing from a sick kid and telling people he's doing charity when he wasn't you know um and it's a, a very long and convoluted story he did that with the oil spill the Royal Kush, the, what he, you know, this is another thing where he um, called it the Magnum Opus, but he made a watered down version of Royal Kush that hermed, and then he called it my brother's Magnum Opus and sold it for obscene amounts of money, again, saying that the money was going to my family when it wasn't. And that's like a slap in the face, you know, my brother's actual work was his Magnum Opus, not this bullshit that Leo made yeah that's that's a that's a bummer to hear that that's sort of how that one's played out and you know we hope your nephew can get all the the funds and um help that he's been promised it it raises another question in my mind in general about the pricing in the retail seed market and much like many other industries in this world you know there's always a high end scene for things but i was wondering what's your thoughts on the high end retail market for breeders who do sell you know what might be described as sort of limited releases or just premium prices in general do you have any issues with that or do you think it's sort of akin to like the premium sneaker market like there's just always going to be demand for the high end exclusive sort of stuff you know i don't have a problem with it i don't charge that much you know i think 200 dollars is the most that you can reasonably charge for a pack of seeds you know and like for that to be justified by the work that you've done but at the same time that there is demand for the most expensive product like the people that buy gucci and uh louis vuitton buy it because it's fucking expensive and it, it gives them a sense of status and uh, like they have something that most people can't get and there is demand for that. And it's a free market where people should create products that are in demand. I have no issue with that. Um, but I think that it would be better. Th those companies that charge $800 for a pack of seeds should also have some offerings that other people can afford. 
you know, you shouldn't just sell the very high end stuff. You should have limited releases maybe of some high end stuff that's expensive. Um, but you should also have some stuff that most people can afford. And also you shouldn't put out F ones that are untested in a fancy box and say that they're this coveted rare, very refined thing when they're not. I, I find, I find that a lot of the companies that charge that much are really taking advantage of people and selling them an inferior product. And I don't like that, you know, but, um, there's, there is demand for that boutique expensive product that's, you know, limited and, you know, hard to get. And I don't fault that. It's just the way that some of these companies have done it isn't super classy. Sure. I mean, I noticed on your website that you had a, a strain called the Real Rosé, and it made me wonder, are you able to give us any more backstory on that one at all? Yeah. Um, you know, so Shiloh and I were, like, in talking about opening a new brand together. Like, the Mandelbrot's Family Heirlooms uh, name was actually something that he thought up and we were planning on putting out the rosé under that label. And then uh, a few months later, you know, like we just hadn't talked for a little while. And then they put out the rosé under Dying Breeds, you know, and they entered it in the cup and they won. And then they made this article saying um, that they didn't know the actual parentage of the rosé. And so, you know, like that the terpene profile of the rosé is definitely royal kush dominant you know that floral profile is royal and they just lied about it and they made this article saying oh we don't know what the parents are you know uh so i definitely felt cheated after all that it was very cool yeah that's that's interesting that they would do that i you know what you're right i remember they entered it in the the emerald cup and uh there was a bit of controversy that year and like I think a lot of people were sort of expecting that rosé to win, but it ended up not winning. And yeah, you know, I don't know. Like, there's, you know, after that happened, there, you know, people that are really well tuned to the history of all this stuff, and like who saw the flower at the cup, they were selling eights at their booth at the cup, and people knew as soon as they opened those jars that it was a royal hybrid, you know, and like, so I got immediately afterwards, people were like, so what's going on with that, you know, uh, why are they? being dishonest and then you know i was like not fully aware of what was going on with it at first and then after they put out that article where they said that they didn't know what the parents were it was you know yeah understandable understandable well look if people are looking to get some uh some real rose seeds it's not just a pun it's also the strain name um you know, I know that you guys have worked hard on getting some um, some distribution out to home growers and just, you know, hobby growers alike. Where would be the best place for people to pick up some of your work? If they yeah, so um, my younger brother, Bogey, started uh, our own bank. It's uh, northcoastnovelties.com. And that's the best place in the U.S. right now to get our stuff. Um, and it's always, you know, like, we make stuff available there before anyone else ever gets it. So if, you know, if you've had trouble getting access to our drops in the past, check that out. Uh, there's both the Emerald Mountain Legacy Instagram and North Coast Novelties, um, where we'll announce all of that, you know, before it goes live. Um, and then in Europe, we have a distributor, Pure Sativa. So they, um, you know, they stock all our stuff and they have a bunch of retailers over there as well. Yeah, nice. And is this also the same place where people can watch some of the mini documentary series that was done on Mandelbrot? Uh, no, actually. So that's at emeraldmountainlegacy.com, which is like an informational website where we don't do any sales. Um, but you, that's a good place to reach out if you have questions about the genetics or about, you know, maybe like how they might perform for you in your environment or anything like that. Um, but the sales are all done through North Coast Novelties. And then we do a lot of like educational and like the video series is posted at emeraldmountainlegacy.com. Yeah. I mean, on the other end of the spectrum, you know, you've done some collabs which have been really quite successful. And the one that I think a lot of people have taken note of is the Royale with Cherries, which is 
not only a collab with me and Gene, but you know, a, a great sort of little play on words from the Pulp Fiction movie. How do you describe that line to people, and will we be seeing more of it? Slash, any more collaborations in the future? Yeah. Um, so that one, you know, it's interesting because a lot of royal crosses come out mostly royal dominant. You know, where it's like royal with a little bit of the elements of the other thing, just because royal has been bred or inbred for a long time. So it has a lot of the traits kind of locked in and they they tend to pass on to the offspring. But the royal with cherries, you know, Jackson does a lot of great work and he um, kind of has a similar thing going on where uh, the traits of his stuff are dominant in the offspring. And that's one of few where, you know, you cross royal with something else and it comes out actually leaning more towards the cherry limeade or whatever, cherry lime pop. Um than it does the royal but so it's a very cherry and lime dominant terpene profile but it has a lot of the strengths of the royal where you know it's mold resistant and chunky and early finishing and it has some gas you know um so that one was really interesting because it didn't follow the trend of being like royal with a little element of something else it's it's really cherry and lime dominant and it's great smoke there uh there's some variation, but they all have lime and cherry in them for sure. And your other question, um, we probably will be doing more collabs, but you know, you, you gotta make something new and test it out. And it, both of us have to approve of how it comes out. And, you know, it's, maybe we'll be able to do that again, and maybe not. It's hard to say. Yeah, sure, understandable. I mean. Another one that I was interested in was you'd done a collab with HBK, the Chili Verde Cross Royal. It's not not a ton of information about that one out there. How would you describe that one for people who might have a pack and are sort of wondering if they want to pop it? Um, it's really interesting. It's the the flavor, like the lavender that comes through in the Chili Verde has this lingering feeling in your mouth where it's like, you have like candy coating in your mouth that just lingers after you take a puff, you know, and that's what I found most intriguing about that cross is that it's got this really nice lingering flavor. Um, and it, it's, again, it's one that has traits of both parents. It doesn't lean one way or the other really. Um, but it's very good. It doesn't yield super well. And some of the plants are a little finicky with feeding and stuff, but the, the terpene profile is really awesome. Yeah, nice, nice little description there. I've always been interested in the Chili Verde crosses because for all the sort of critical acclaim it's it's had, you really don't see it getting used in a lot of crosses, but that'll be a cool one for people to check out. Yeah. So the next question I had, which was submitted by one of the listeners, was they were sort of wondering if you were aware of any differences between the Long Valley Royal Kush, which was put out by Aficionado versus the Royal Kush. And specifically, this person said, you know, I got some of the Long Valley Royal and um, wasn't didn't really feel like it took in the direction that the Royal Kush was described as. Do you feel like there's some pretty big differences in those releases or they are fairly similar given it's sort of just line worked? Uh, no, they are very different. <laughs> And I have some theories about that, but I don't want to get into the drama of all that. Um, so I'd rather not fully answer that one. But they are different. I'll say that. Okay, sure. So maybe we'll just leave it as, you know, if you tried the Long Valley Royal and you weren't impressed, maybe just give the real deal a go and put some faith in that. Yeah. Okay, cool, cool, cool. Just a few more questions before we jump into the tail end. The strain which I think probably most caught my eye on the site was in fact the 47. And it's sort of interesting because I'm assuming it's a little bit more special, a little bit more rare. It's it's priced a little differently, but when you read the description, it sort of makes sense. How would you pitch this to someone? Would this maybe be a good option for our friend in the last question who didn't have the best experience with the Long Valley? Yeah. Um, so if you actually want the original authentic Royal Kush don't go for the 47. The 47 is different, but it's amazing. You know, it's very good. It's just its own separate thing kind of 
Um, there are some phenotypes that are like smell like cantaloupe, and that like it just looks incredible. The, I think the look of it is really special, and it's very early finishing. Um, but not all of them are super gassy, authentic Royal Kush phenos. But there there are some phenos in there that are incredibly gassy. It's just that they're in there with a mix of that and a more fruity kind of uh, different variation on it. So as far as looks, it's one of the best looking flowers I've ever grown. And I really like all the different profiles of it, but there are some different ones. And the the gassy, more royal, authentic royal is in there, but it's, you know, it's, you got to hunt through them to find it. And that is, if you do find it, it's incredible. But if you're wanting all the seeds to come out gassy, um, just go with the like Royal Kush nine or 10, you'll find more gassy phenos in there. But the one, the, the couple of phenos that are really gassy in the 47 are super special. And, you know, it's just kind of a, more of a grab bag. Um, but one that you'll be happy with, I think. Yeah, nice. I mean, you've certainly got me hyped to to grow out some royal seeds and see what I can find. It's a special line by the sounds of it, no question. So, in terms of, I mean, we've kind of touched on this, but I just want to get a definitive verdict so that the listeners know for sure. Out of all the crosses you've been able to create since starting Emerald Mountain Legacy, if you could only recommend one to someone without really knowing much about their preferences, but just something that you can really stand behind, which of the crosses you've made would you recommend to someone? Uh, if I have to pick one, it would be the Royal Wedding. Um, you know, it kind of checks all the boxes. It, it yields very well. It's very mold resistant. It's easy to grow. It has good structure. It's gassy and it's purple and it comes out consistently you know like there's not a ton of variation in how they come out um so for for our more recent projects that one uh, just across the board really kind of gets everything or you know it uh covers all the bases i would say and you know but there are different ones like my favorite pheno out of everything i've made is a royal limes pheno that's very skunky and uh it's got that limey gas skunk kind of thing going on but not all the seeds come out that way you know so but the royal wedding i'd say is consistently great and really fits the the demand out there yeah great response and sort of as a follow-up to that given the wedding cake in the lineage you mentioned that you like sort of being able to work these hype strains into sort of more well-behaved lines, shall we say. Um, another question we got was, do you ever feel like the brand culture or hype culture sort of affects your breeding in that there's sort of like a bit of pressure to work with these super new exotic cookie varieties, which admittedly a lot of the old school breeders are not as fond of as, say, the more newer modern enthusiasts. Do you ever feel pressured to work with them or not really if you do? It's just... Yeah, definitely. Like if you want to sell seeds for profit, unfortunately, you need to cross stuff that you like with the hypey in demand stuff like cookies and the sherbs and GMO. Or actually, I love GMO and I would grow that all the time. That's not one that's a good example of the hype. But, you know, like the look that cookies and sherb and all this stuff have. And it's kind of what the market has come to expect good flower to look like and it, i think it's pretty much all looks driven you know it's like these real dense kind of triangular geometric um shapes that are super frosty and um it's just the way they look that people really like and so i do make hybrids with that stuff because it's in demand and you know you're trying to sell seeds you gotta make some that are in demand but what i'm more passionate about is the old school stuff like the headbands and the sours and um skunkier stuff and if like if i was just breeding for my own interests i would do that all the time and i wouldn't touch any of that other hypey stuff but you know you kind of have to do both and um you know like 
you have your passion projects, but you also have stuff that is high demand. That makes sense, Ben, bringing a balance to the table. So another thing I wanted to flag, if, if listeners haven't seen it already, there's this like fantastic video series that was sort of made about Mandelbrot's life and a lot of the work and it, it kind of a lot of various aspects of sort of his overall legacy and work. Was there anything in that which maybe didn't get touched on that you were hoping you shed some light on for the public? Oh, man, that's a big, big question. Um, definitely there is, um, but I don't want to go into too much detail because I like I like the organic kind of like just starting to talk about that stuff and seeing where it goes. And I don't, I'm not really planning how the next videos we'll make will go right now. I, I kind of just like to play it by ear and let people say what they want to say about him or, you know, I don't want to, I don't want it to be formulaic. I want it to be more of like a, a conversation. Oh, okay, cool. So I guess the takeaway is that there, there's going to be more videos produced in that series and we'll find out even more. Yeah. Uh, you know what? We had planned to do a season this year, but I have too much on my plate and the GW Smoke Break guys do too. You know, I think the series they made with us kind of created a lot of demand for more of that sort of stuff. And so they have, you know, probably a dozen projects they're working on this year. And I'm right now trying to expand my business into Michigan. And so I'm splitting my time between California and Michigan. And it's, it's a lot, you know, so we're taking some time off and we're going to, you know, kind of play it by ear and see when we can get back to it. Yeah. Understandable. You know, you're juggling a lot of balls there. So uh, kudos for that. I guess the final question before we jump into the final quick five questions we ask everyone is, What's your thoughts on the way the market in terms of breeding and selling seeds is sort of moving? And what do you think Mac's thoughts on this would have been? Um, I don't know. I, uh, it's definitely moving in a direction that's more focused on, indoor. you know, um, more and more people are buying seeds to grow indoors in their, their small, you know, personal use garden and, Unfortunately, the commercial growers that are growing at scale outdoors are having to move more and more towards clone-based cultivation because, you know, like the testing requirements, you have to have a lot of product that's all exactly the same or, you know, you'd have to, it's hard to sell a bunch of small batches that are different, that have a different chemical profile and stuff. So a lot more over the, the years it's become where the outdoor growers are growing from clone more and more because they need that consistency. And the people who are buying seeds are doing it to find special stuff that they want to run indoors, or maybe they're, they're in a place where there's not a legal clone market and they can't just go out and buy clones. So they're buying seeds because they can be mailed discreetly to their location where maybe the government's not very friendly to cannabis or whatever. And so the landscape has changed a lot. It used to be that we sold a lot of seeds in bulk to farmers in our area, but more and more it's like people in the UK and all over South America or wherever um, that the only way that they can get interesting genetics is in seed form. And that's why they're doing it, you know? Um, So I would like to continue to focus breeding on stuff that performs well outdoors and does well in my local climate. But the, the truth is the demand is not there. It's in, you know, what will do well for people indoors on a smaller scale. And so, you know, you have to cater to both. And um, I think it's unfortunate that, outdoor growers who are in the regulated market are not able to continue to grow from seed and to, you know, because seed plants are really strong outdoors and clones sometimes have problems that uh, seeds wouldn't have, but the way it's all regulated and the, the new market has kind of forced us all in a direction. We just have to go along. Um, 
I don't think that Mac would like that much, you know, but it is what it is. Sure. So, I mean, if you could make one sort of change in the current, you know, legalities around it, what would you do? Like, uh, just to give you an example of what I mean, in the past, we've heard a lot of people sort of um, talk about how the one acre rule that was always proposed before legalization, which has since sort of been changed a bit, they always felt like that would allow sort of fair competition between small and big growers. What's your thoughts? Is there any sort of glaring changes you'd like to make in the laws? Well, that's the perfect example. I would love for the law to actually be what was promised to the people who voted for uh, 64, you know, like it definitely said right in the short paragraph description that large scale farms wouldn't be allowed to operate until 2023. And even then there would be a conversation about whether huge corporate scaled agriculture would be allowed to take over, you know, and I really don't want that to happen. I don't think smokers want that to happen. The product's going to be worse and it's you know they're going to have shady business practices that choke out small farmers that have been doing this their whole lives and who are better at it and more passionate about it um the way like we were sold a bill of goods and it was a a scam all along you know it was definitely plotted out that they would have this loophole to you know get the like the previous iteration of the California legalization or adult use law failed because all the people in the Emerald Triangle showed up to vote against it because they knew it was a corporate takeover. So on the next try, they they cleverly crafted this false narrative of like, oh no, we're going to make sure that small farmers have a seat at the table, all this stuff. And that was bullshit, you know? Uh, It was definitely a wolf in sheep's clothing. So if we could go back and get that right and make you know small farmers competitive and protected i would love to do that i I think it's unrealistic to expect it but i would do it if i could yeah nice that's a pretty understandable change that i think a lot of people could get behind so to jump in our final five questions that we ask everyone who comes on the show, first one being, what is the best or most memorable single smoke you can recall? That's tough. Um, headband for me personally, like the effect, it's something special about it. Like I can smoke headband that's like 17% THC and get way more ripped or way more in the mode that I want to be in uh, from, you know, like 17% THC, 3% total terpenes, um, which it doesn't on paper look very impressive compared to a lot of the stuff that's out there these days. But uh, from personal use and like the way it affects me, it's really perfect, you know, and it, it doesn't matter that it's not that potent. It still affects me the way I want it to every day. I can smoke it exclusively and it would still get me where I want to go whereas you know I could go buy something that's 30 percent THC and not get that effect like it's the numbers are not what's important on paper as far as what affects you the way you want it to you know it's uh it's more complicated than that yeah certainly so I I mean I guess on the other end of the spectrum, was there ever a strain where, you know, everyone was really hyping it up and just sort of excited. And then when you finally tried it, you were like left a bit disappointed. Yeah, for sure. Um, I feel like I'd be calling out a breeder though. If I were to say, Oh, I hate this one thing. I don't want to do that, but there is definitely stuff out there that, um, I don't think is as good as the market has made it appear to be, you know, I don't want to be specific, though. Uh, Diplomatic, I can get behind that. Okay, so the next one being, let's do a desert island situation. If you're getting dropped off to a desert island and you can only grow three strains or, you know, they could be clones or they could be packs of seeds, which three are you taking with you? Um, I'd say headband, oil spill, and GMO. Ooh, nice. GMO lover. 
yeah, it, you know, it's a cookie cross, and I have feelings about it, but I like the weed. It's really good. That's good stuff. That's good stuff. I'm sure there's a lot of our listeners out there right now who are like, just take the Chem D. You can harvest it quicker. <laughs> No, no, no. I, uh, I have love for the GMO. Don't worry. So the next question is the. It's sort of the same situation. We're dropping. We're dro- doing the island situation, except this time, rather than you staying there, it's someone else, and you don't really like them that much. What three strains are you going to leave them? Um, Jack and Trainwreck, and uh, Green Crack. <laughs> there you go you know what's funny like i totally get where you're coming from with that but as someone who hasn't been around in the the california region my whole life i'm like not burnt out on jack so i'd probably happily take that but that's 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 a good one i like that it makes me paranoid i feel terrible if i smoke that stuff you know like i feel like climbing out a window i don't know what it is yeah. it's interesting like how you get these sort of geographical differences in taste like as you've sort of alluded to, anywhere in the Mendo area, you offer someone train wreck, they just laugh at you. But I'm like, man, give it to me. Like, I've only had it a few times. But yeah, there you go. Yeah, you know, that's interesting. The yeah, Like you said, the geographic element of that. Okay, so final question for the interview. If you could go back to any place in time, presumably to collect seeds or a clone, you can go anywhere, anytime throughout history, where are you going, when, and what are you grabbing? Uh, so definitely, I would say the, the Hindu Kush mountains, or, you know, the, like, um, India and Afghanistan, or, you know, the whole region. I don't know if I could sp- pick a specific area, but the high mountains of Afghanistan or, or that general area, um, and you know, like the Hindu Kush as a cultivar, I think is really amazing. And the, the, like the wide open land race that that comes from, I would love to really hunt through that. Yeah, that's a, that's a popular choice. I think some of those old Hindu Afghani sort of genetics are certainly fable. So I think that pretty much brings us to the end of things. Were there any comments or shout outs you wanted to make before we wrap up? Uh, no, I think uh, I'd just like to say I really appreciate the opportunity to talk to you. And I, I think you, uh, you really covered the entire spectrum of what people ask me about all the time. And you, you did a good job uh, kind of boiling it down and making it uh, interesting for people. So kudos to you and thank you again for having me uh you're too generous it's it's always the guests that make the episode so any positive comments about this it's it's because of you but you know thanks so much again for everything you do you know at emerald mountain legacy but also for taking the time to chat with today it's been fantastic yeah thank you i appreciate it good talking to you And there you have it, my friends. A huge shout out to Ben for coming on the show, for dropping the knowledge and for filling us in on all the things going down at Emerald Mountain Legacies. I'm certainly grateful for this one and I hope you are as well. But likewise, I'm hugely grateful for our sponsors as always. Seeds here now, number one seed bank in the game. Guarantee on satisfaction, not just germination. If you're looking for some killer auto flowers, check out their newest drop from Gas Reaper. Or if you want some fire chem dog lines, Check out Lucky Dog Seed Co. Last but not least, Mean Gene of Mendocino. Does the man need introduction? They've got freeborn selections. They've got you covered no matter what you're after. Check them out. Seeds here now, number one in the industry. Likewise, Copet Biologic- Biological Systems. You know them, you love them. They've got the predators to keep your garden happy and healthy. If you're looking to avoid any week four flower infestation from mites, check out their Ultimite product. A phenomenal product with proof of predation technology built into it. You can literally see it working in front of your eyes as the predators go from clear to red. You know they're doing their job. Shout out again to Copper Biological System for all the organic and plant-friendly solutions you need to keep the pathogens and pests at bay. 
Likewise, Promix Connect, thank you so much for your support. Many of the listeners probably already use their mediums, but guess what? They've got a standalone mycorrhizal product, which is absolutely killer. Promix Connect, check it out. Your number one high-quality mycorrhizal spores, guaranteed spore viability in each pack, resulting in increased yield, flavors, terpenes, resin, biomass, you name it. Mycorrhizal is a phenomenal product and this is the best one in the market as far as I'm concerned. Check it out, Promix Connect. Last but not least, Charlie's Cannabis. We really appreciate these guys. They're doing exactly what this show is all about, producing some of the most high quality craft, small batch cannabis you can imagine out of Oklahoma family owned and run these guys not only have the most killer flower you're looking for but also extracts and more live resin bho sugar batter hand rolled water hash infused missiles all using in-house products nothing is externally sourced everything comes from them with the highest attention to detail put into every product produced this is truly a premium cannabis product check them out if you're looking to smoke good and you're nearby Check them out if you're looking to smoke good. Shout out Charlie's Cannabis. And last but not least, huge thank you to the Patreon gang. We love you. We appreciate you guys. You are the best. I hope you enjoy hearing this early before the rest do. If you would like to help support the show and to continue and to help continue to see episodes produced, please go check out patreon.com forward slash the podcast. You'll get access to unheard interviews, additional content, and so much more. We appreciate you guys. And that's about it for this episode, gang. I'll catch you for the next one. See you.